Good morning, friends. Good to be with you again. As we continue finding our way through this difficult situation, this COVID-19, we are often perplexed and perhaps even a little bit anxious. We don't know what's happening in the future. Um, we struggle to place our trust in God, and yet that's what we need to do. And so this morning, let's look at the story of Benaiah. Have you ever heard of Benaiah? You'll find the story of Benaiah in Samuel chapter 23, particularly around the 20th verses and onwards. Benaiah was one of David's mighty men, a man David counted on throughout his life. He was the trusted captain of David's personal bodyguard, and you'll find that in Samuel 23, 23. When David was old and dying, Benaiah stood by his son Solomon and became chief of the entire army, and that's from 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 35. Benaiah himself had taken on an Egyptian giant and killed him with the giant's own weapon. That's from 2 Samuel 23, 21. He was a man who was greatly used of God. So, of course, he too had to fight a giant. But what stands out with Benaiah is one of the most unusual stories ever recorded in the Old Testament. The entire story is told in just one brief sentence. But it is such a significant event that here we are some 3,000 years later that we can examine the story just a little bit. This increased hardship came into Benaiah's life in a flash, in a moment. It's very apparent that he never saw this life-threatening event coming. It came at him fast, what you might call a classic blindside, and immediately everything in his life became worse. And why? Well, here's the one sentence, description of what happened to Benaiah from 2 Samuel 23, verse 20. This is from the New American Standard Bible. He also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. Now, let's just think about that for a moment. In a pit on a snowy day, difficult conditions underfoot, trapped in a pit with a lion, one of the most fierce predators you could find anywhere in the world. Can you imagine killing a lion, not with a high-powered rifle from 100 meters or 200 meters away with a telescope, but in a pit, that's hand-to-hand -hand combat like you've never seen before. It's tough to keep your footing on the snow and the ice. And this was a life-threatening event for Benaiah. So it's easy to read this account as we are, as I am here, sitting in this chair, enjoying the warm sun coming in over my left shoulder here. But what about Benaiah on this cold, probably windy, snowy day? And here's this lion in the bottom of the pit. And this is not a fable. This really happened. It's recorded in the Bible. It's recorded history. Fighting in a pit on a snowy day, that's what you might call an intense aerobic workout. Years ago, the great preacher of New Zealand, Frank W. Borman, did a sermon on Benaiah, and he made three interesting points. He said, Benaiah met the worst of enemies, the lion, in the worst of places, a pit, under the worst of conditions, a snowy day. So it doesn't get much worse than that. And what did Benaiah do about the situation? Did he cry about his unfair circumstances, or perhaps try and melt away into the crowd at the edge of the pit? No, the man of God that he was, he just rolled up his sleeves and he took care of business. It's another example of a man who desired to be used by God to face those giants in his life. And this giant of increased hardship is one of the toughest you will ever encounter. And perhaps this situation that we're going through is one of the toughest that we might ever encounter. But the point is this, that this too will pass. And that's the good news. And here's a principle that you can count on. Facing the giant of increased hardship means that deliverance is right around the corner. Maybe not tomorrow or next week, but deliverance is coming. And that's what we need to take hold of. And we need to place our trust in the Lord. And this is what it is when we learn to live a life, when we trust in God. Amen. Have a blessed day. Thank you.
church family. This morning's reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we'll be reading from verse 1 to 11. The Resurrection of Christ Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Herein ends the reading. May the Lord bless it to our hearts. Good morning. Let us join together as we pray together. Let us pray. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. O gracious Father, we bring our prayers and petitions to you, our mighty God, this day. We confess that we have not loved you as we ought. We do not do good to those who hate us. We do not bless or pray for those who mistreat us and persecute us. Forgive us, we pray, as we humbly repent. We bring before you this morning our beautiful land, South Africa. We pray for our president that you would give to him wisdom and grace to do what is right in your eyes. 
help him in his cabinet to make wise choices during this difficult time in our country. We pray for all those on the front line of the virus, the police, the nurses, the doctors. We ask for your protection on them. For those who are ill, we pray for peace and for your will to be done. O oh, gracious God, though we cannot meet together today in body, we are together in spirit. And so we pray that you would build your church that we may glorify your holy name. Help us to be joyful always, to pray continually, to give thanks in all circumstances. Make our hearts so sensitive to your direction that we would follow you alone in all things. We pray for Corin and Jeremy. Give them wisdom and grace as they serve you. Indeed, Lord, we are so thankful that Candy is coming home. We also pray for the birth of their grandchild, that all would be well. Be with those who are ill amongst us. Comfort those who mourn. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning, dear church family. We have been on a journey with Paul as he has taken us through this first letter addressed to the Corinthian believers. It's a letter of correction because the church in Corinth had moved away from the true gospel. As is often the case, this church had begun so well, but then they tried to accommodate the surrounding culture, and in doing so, they became just like the world. So Paul needed to remind them of what the gospel is. Now the key to the gospel, the thing that stands out, as unique among all other religions, is the resurrection. Paul has dealt with many other issues affecting this church, all of which were detracting from the true gospel. He now turns to a matter of prime importance, and a topic that held much interest among the Corinthian church, the resurrection of the body. We need to understand the context into which Paul was addressing this topic of resurrection. The resurrection was denied from two opposing points of view. First, there were the materialists, such as the Sadducees, who denied the resurrection, believing that the mental and spiritual life were only manifestations of the physical life, and the physical was dependent on the spiritual. They concluded that with death, the whole life of the individual terminates. It would appear that the Corinthians had adopted this kind of thinking, which prompted Paul to say in verse 32 of our chapter, If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's the view of a materialist who believes there is no future life after death. Many others who opposed materialism held that the resurrection of the body was an undesirable thought. After all, the body is the source of sin. So they persuaded themselves that all Paul meant by a resurrection was the mystical or spiritual dying with Christ and rising again. They declared that the resurrection was a past event and that all believers were already risen in Christ. This led them to want to be free from all connection with physical matter. So to promise them a resurrection of the body was to offer them a very unsavory thought. However, the resurrection is the cornerstone of the Christian faith, and it needs to be understood biblically. That's why Paul says in chapter 15, verse 14, If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. In fact, says Paul, we are, not actu we are actually misrepresenting God. In other words, we are liars, and the truth is not in us. This would be the most heinous of all crimes. Why? Because we would be deceiving people. But it's worse than that. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, it means we are still in our sins, verse 17, and then we are of all people to be most to be pitied, verse 18. Saints throughout the ages have staked their eternal destiny on the reality of the resurrection and many have given their lives for that belief. We live with the hope that this world is not all there is, 
In reality, this world is not even the most important part. While we still have breath, we are to live and do everything to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 We are to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Colossians 3 verse 2 It's because a believer has died in Christ that their life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Colossians 3 verse 3 Paul said in Romans 10 verses 9 to 11, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. We live now with the hope of the life which is to come, when we will be in the presence of God in glory for an eternity. And that hope is not based on some hypothetical spiritual rhetoric. It rests firmly on the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. That fact is where our hope lies. Jesus said in John 11 verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall never die. That's why we can sing, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. This is an incredible fact. Those who believe in Christ will never die. Of course there's a moment when the physical body gives up, when life as we know it ceases to be. But death just happens to be the revolving door through which we pass from this life into the presence of our Lord. Everything in Christianity hinges on the resurrection. If Christ never rose out of the grave, then neither do we, and we are still in our sins and without any hope. On becoming a believer, we no longer live for ourselves, we live for Christ. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. After our conversion, the Lord only keeps us here on this earth for one purpose, and that is to glorify his name with our lives. And the way we do that is to tell the lost about the gospel, so he may draw them into his kingdom. So the resurrection is critical to Christianity. Without it, there is no Christianity. There is no gospel, and there is no hope. That's why throughout history the resurrection has been attacked and assaulted. Christians throughout the ages have been imprisoned, persecuted, and even killed for believing in the resurrection. But the true church has never given up on the clear fact that Christ was raised from the dead. God knew that this aspect of the faith would come under constant attack, so together with the Gospels, Paul gives us this whole chapter dealing with the resurrection. Now Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church about 20 years after the resurrection, way before Luke and John, probably around the same time that Matthew and Mark were written. So 1 Corinthians was a very early defense of the resurrection. In a court of law, you have circumstantial evidence and what is called direct evidence. What Paul records for us here in this chapter, the overwhelming proof of the resurrection, and he includes eyewitness testimony of those who encountered the power and presence of the risen Christ. Bear in mind that Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 states that one witness is not enough to convict a man of any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Well, Paul gives us direct testimony from five different sources and presents us with a defense of the resurrection. A lot rests on this testimony, because if Christ did in fact rise from the dead, then he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is God, the Messiah, the Savior. He is the death conqueror and the sin bearer. So first we have the testimony of the church. Verse 1. Now I would remind you, brethren, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, 
unless you believed in vain. The reason you are a church is evidence that Christ rose from the dead. Saints all around the world would have been transformed by faith in the living Christ, the very gospel Paul preached. It's this gospel you have to receive, to stand firm on, and by which you are saved. Note the conditional if in verse 2. This emphasizes perseverance. There are some people who say all you have to do is believe and you're saved. But there is much more to being saved than that. The Christian life is a life that perseveres until the last breath has been taken. Salvation is not restricted to something that happens in the past. Justification is a one-off event that happens the moment you move from darkness to light. But salvation is an ongoing process called sanctification. We are saved at the moment of conversion. That's our justification. We are being saved one day at a time, our sanctification which involves a daily battle as the Holy Spirit works in us to bring our carnal nature under the authority of the Lord. And one day we will be forever delivered from the power of sin, which is our glorification. As believers, we become a living testimony to the power of the resurrection of Christ. And one day we will finally be saved when we cross the finish line and collapse into the arms of our Lord. This is the essential witness of the church. How else can you explain the survival of the church over the last 2,000 years? How else can you explain the ongoing power of the church in the lives of believers? How else can you explain the conversions that continue to take place across the world? But there is a caveat, verse 2, unless you believed in vain. Paul is saying that it is possible to have a belief that has no eternal effect. There are many people who believe that Jesus existed, that he died on a cross, that he was a good man, a wonderful teacher, but that's about as far as their belief goes. They have a belief, but it doesn't go far enough. James chapter 2 verse 19 says, You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 22, Christ has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you, the believer, holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith. Again, we have a condition, if you continue in the faith. And continuing in the faith, persevering in the faith, is simply evidence of real conversion. Jesus said in John 8 verse 31, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So Paul is simply saying, if your faith is saving faith, you will hold fast to the word, never deny the word, never reject the word. And where do you find these people? The first place to look is to the church. That's where you see the living Christ living through his people. You and I, dear friends, are living proof of the reality of the resurrection. Had the crucifixion of Jesus really been the end, there would be no Christian church. The disciples would have remained holed up in that locked room for fear of the authorities and melted into obscurity. The gospel would have died. A dead Messiah would be no Messiah at all. And that's why Romans 1 verse 4 says that God declared him to be the Christ by raising him from the dead. Without the resurrection, there would be no church and no Christianity, but the church has been alive and growing since the day of Christ's resurrection. The experience of every believer is living proof to the resurrected Christ. Second, the testimony of Scripture, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, 
that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. If, it, if anyone wants to know what the Gospel message is, this is where you bring them. Now remember, Paul wasn't around when Jesus died. He never sat under the Lord's teaching. That's why he says in Galatians 1 verse 1, I would have you know, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He received his, this gospel message directly from the source, and the message is that Christ died for our sins. That's what the scriptures affirm, and that he, being genuinely dead, was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel message. Christ died is a, is a historical fact. That he died for our sins was the substitutionary atonement. That he took our place, took on the full wrath of God. That he was buried and rose again on the third day, making many post-resurrection appearances to doubting apostles and others, is affirmed by scripture. scripture which is perfect, right, and true, Psalm 90. That's the gospel, the good news. And why is it good news? Because it means that our sins are paid for, our justification has been purchased, and eternal life is guaranteed. This is what the scriptures affirm. Whether it's Isaiah 53, or Psalm 16, or one of the gospels, both the Old Testament and the New Testament bears witness to the fact that the Messiah would die as the final sacrifice and substitute for sin, after which there would be no more sacrifices, and that he would be raised from the dead. So the resurrection can be proved firstly through the testimony of the living church, and secondly through the testimony of scripture. And then third, the resurrection can be proved through the testimony of eyewitnesses, verse 5. And he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive. Remember, this would be about 20 to 25 years after the resurrection. So some eyewitnesses were still living. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me. The testimony of eyewitnesses is vital, as long as they are credible and of sound mind. And that's what Paul appeals to now. First up is Peter. Now Peter wouldn't be a good candidate to fabricate a resurrection story. Remember the last encounter he had with Jesus was a confrontation because he had just denied him on three different occasions. So how amazing that Jesus chose to appear to Peter first, a demonstration of our Lord's forgiving love and forgiving grace. Also Peter would be the least likely to assert himself as a preacher of the resurrection because he was so ashamed and broken. So the fact that Peter did preach with such power and conviction is testimony to the truth of the risen Christ. He would never have the confidence to come up with a resurrection story if it was in fact, and he certainly wouldn't have been crucified upside down for a lie. Second up are the twelve. Actually, there were only ten. Judas was dead, and Thomas wasn't present on that occasion. Third up are 500 at one time. Some had died, but the majority of these 500 were still alive some 20 to 25 years after the resurrection. They had spent a quarter of a century talking about the resurrection. Fourth up is James. This is probably the Lord's brother because he's mentioned apart from the other apostles. Now remember the Lord's half-brothers according to John chapter 7 verse 5 didn't believe in Jesus. In fact, Mark 3 says they thought he was crazy. So James would, wouldn't have been a likely candidate to fabricate the resurrection. It's interesting to note that both Peter and James were deniers of Christ, and they are the only two names mentioned. When Peter saw Christ alive, he became the founder of the church. And when James saw Christ alive, he believed and became the leader of the Jerusalem church. Two unlikely eyewitnesses, and then all the apostles, 
and there were repeated appearances according to Acts chapter 1 over another 40 days. Fifth up is Paul himself. Paul was also an unlikely candidate to fabricate the resurrection. He was a persecutor of the church. He didn't believe anything about Jesus. Paul says in verse 8, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So we have Peter the denier, James the unbeliever, and Paul the untimely born. Now the word for untimely born means a premature birth. It's an aborted fetus. Paul is like a dead fetus. What a way to refer to yourself. I'm nothing but a miscarriage. Jesus picks out a denier, an unbeliever, and a dead fetus to be witnesses of his glorious gospel. Paul was the least. He was worse than Peter the denier, and worse than James the unbeliever. He was an enemy of the church. But they all have one thing in common. They had all seen the risen Christ, an unlikely trio of witnesses who could never fabricate the resurrection. So we have these five different eyewitnesses. The prosecution rests its case. But, and finally, we have the testimony of the common message. Verse 11. Whether then it was I or they, that's the apostles and the rest of the eyewitnesses, so we preach. What do we preach? Verse 1. The gospel. Whether it's me or them, we all preach the same message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what you received, what you stand on, and how you are saved. You see, they all only preach one thing. There wasn't a mixed message. It was a common message preached to everyone. The problem the church is experiencing today is that we are not preaching one common message. The church, as seen by the world, is offering many potential options to salvation. But in the first century, there was but one message. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised on the third day. That's what we preached. That's what you believed. And that's what will save you. And here we are over 2,000 years after the resurrection and we continue to preach the same message. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. If you believe in Christ and confess him as Lord, you will be saved. Dear friends, have you believed in this glorious gospel? Let us pray. O oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for the reality of the resurrection, the power of these eyewitnesses you have left us in your word. We thank you that our Lord lives that he died for our sins, that he paid in full the penalty for our sins, so that we may be saved by grace alone, through faith alone. All we have to do is to ask for your forgiveness, turn from our sin, and believe in your Son, embracing the work that Christ achieved on the cross. I pray, Lord, that those who have not yet received your salvation would turn from their sin and place their trust in the one who died for them, was buried and rose again, and based on his resurrection, showed us the path we will follow if we have believed on the name that is above every name. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen.